This is lesson number two of Death, Hades, Heaven, and Hell. And once again, the primary scripture that we use for this is Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Uh, we're not going to go over that text this morning. We're going to go and jump into our lesson this morning. And there is the, uh, the big picture. And I did not make the copies of these uh, this week. I'll try to get that done this week for you, Danny, and, and for everybody. Uh, get that done so you can have a closer look at them. Last week we did this. We did an introductory study on uh, just the basic setup of it and, and looked over some things that cause people trouble. Uh, differences of opinions uh, going through the concept of the Hadean realm uh, in particular. Uh, paradise and torments and some of the things in uh, Luke chapter 16 as Jesus talks about uh, uh, the difference there in paradise and, and torments in that Hadean realm. So you can review that. It's been posted up on Facebook. Charlie, yes, you can find it there. Uh, but what we're going to do today is delve into the first portion of this. And maybe just starting it, we'll see how it goes. I haven't looked at this to time it. We're going to look at Earth life. Where, where do we start at? Well, we're going to start at where we are. What are the conditions of earth life? What, where do we find ourselves at this point in time? And, of course, we go back to the beginning. God created human beings in His image. That's Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him male and female, he created them. So, we know the story, Genesis chapter 1, <coughs> last, or the, the sixth day of creation, which would be on a Friday, God creates human beings. And chapter 2 goes into it in a little more depth, it is the Lord who forms man out of the dust of the earth, breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. And then we find out that in all of this creation, it's not good for man to be alone. So the Lord causes a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, takes a rib from Adam's side, okay? Fashions from that rib a woman to be by Adam's side. Male and female, he created them. But he created them in his own image. What is the image of God? Well, God is a spiritual being. God created us as human beings in a spiritual image. A spiritual image with a physical, earthly being also uh, physical bodies. We can dwell here upon the face of this earth, and we also know, just jumping way ahead forward, that after the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension to heaven, it's a body that can also be transformed to be able to live in heaven for eternity. But we'll get to that later on in the study. But in the image of God, not to be gods, but to reflect God and to reflect the nature of God. A lot of that is just purely being able to think and to understand, to make choices, to have free will. God has free will. 
God knows the difference between right and wrong. But God will never choose to do that which is wrong. God created man, starting with Adam, starting with Eve, with free will. Placed them in the Garden of Eden. Two trees were there. One was the tree of life, which they could eat, and as long as they ate of that tree of life, they would live forever. The other was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They were told not to eat of that tree because if they ate of that tree, they would die. Now, why would they die knowing good from evil? Well, I guess we would say it's a presumption to say. I guess we would say it's a presumption to say. Let me rephrase that. I guess we would say the presumption is we're different from God. Where God can know good and evil and not do evil, know right from wrong and not do wrong, we as human beings are not mature enough, wise enough to know good from evil and not do evil. Because once we know evil, the impulse is there for us to do it. And especially, and especially when it comes to the point where somebody does evil to us. What's our basic inclination? Strike back. Get them back. Yeah. yeah. So once we understand a hurt, once we understand somebody doing something wrong to us, we want to do what is wrong to them. A good case in point then comes in Genesis chapter 3, right? Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 4, Genesis chapter 4. Cain and Abel, look at that. What happens? Both of them bring sacrifices to God, right? <laughs> to worship God. Abel brings from the flock of the field a blood sacrifice, offers it to God, and God accepts it. Cain brings the fruit of the field, vegetables or fruit or what, whatever it is, and God says, that's not what I asked for. I'm not accepting it. So Cain gets upset. He feels hurt because God does not accept his sacrifice. He accepts Cain's sacrifice. What does God tell him? If you do what's right, you'll be accepted. But he can't accept that. So what does he do? He takes it out on <coughs> his brother, Abel. Like it's Abel's fault for doing what was right. He was hurt because he did something wrong, but he didn't want to face up to the fact. He just needed to do what was right. And there are several things we could really talk about on this. But capture this point. We're not born sinners. We acquire sin in our lives. The death that God said that Adam and Eve would receive if they ate of the knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, first of all, yes, it would lead to a physical death because there was going to be a separation between them and God. A separation between them and the tree of life because God was going to drive them out of the Garden of Eden but there's also that spiritual death because they are separated from God God would come the Lord would come and walk with them in in the garden as soon as they sinned they were afraid of God and they hid themselves because they were ashamed of themselves. So that spiritual death, that separation from God, 
led to a physical death, the separation from the tree of life. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22 and 23, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us. One of us. Well, who is he talking to? Father and Holy Spirit. The Word is talking to the Father and the Holy Spirit, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of, from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. So contrary to false doctrine, the false doctrine of inherited sin, we are born without sin, but we are lost when we sin against God's commands. Now, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, tells us the soul who sins shall die. Not the soul that inherits sin, but the soul that sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. The word, who come up with this concept of you inherit your father's sins? You know, the Apostle Paul talks about some stuff in the Roman letter. He talks about the sinful nature and such. You can go back and you can read it, but but he never says that... that well, he actually talks about uh, sin and, and uh, how that Adam started the whole thing off, in essence. Uh, now, we know that Eve partook of the fruit first, but it was Adam that was held accountable through God's Word. Because Adam had been given that instruction and God held him accountable. But his children were not, did not inherit his sin. So it's a false understanding of what was going on and what Paul is talking about in the Roman letter. In fact, Paul isn't talking about that. But what he's talking about is we're born into a fallen world. Notice here on the chart, all humans were born into this realm where sin exists. It's a fallen world. Everything around us has been corrupted by sin. God tried to take care of it once with the flood, right? Start over again. But here's where we're at. Let me go down here and finish this thought. Well, no, let me pull around here. So you can see when, when we talk about earth life, all humans represents the whole realm of humanity. All people who have ever lived. And then we're going to talk about James chapter 1 verse 13 through 16 and understand how that we go from this point into being a lost sinner. In the Bible, it's is explicit on that concept. So, the nature of sin, James chapter 1, verses uh, 13 through 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire, then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So you can see in the chart here, a lust. A lust. 
put Adam and Eve here, the first two human beings. Adam and Eve. You can eat of the tree of life, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When you do, you're going to die. But what happened? What, what was the first thing that really stands out in Scripture about that tree of the knowledge of good and evil and that, that Satan points out to Eve? God? Well, that's one thing, but there was something else. You sure won't die? You won't die. Well, I'm looking at something. At, uh, if you go back and look at it, they saw that it was good for food. Desired. Yeah. They lusted after it. They lusted after Like a, wow. <clears throat> You know, there are some apples that look really nice and shiny because they're waxed up and all. Oh, boy, that, that is really a good-looking piece of fruit. And then the serpent, who's Satan, and the serpent says, Hey, why don't you just go ahead and get you a bite of that? That does look pretty good. I don't know, God said... We can't do that because when we do, we will die. Nah, you won't die. God just told you that because you eat that and you'll be like God. Well, how would they be like God? They would know good and evil, right? Which God can handle they couldn't. We can't. Right? I've always, the Garden of Eden being a perfect place, the only reason I could understand that there was a, that tree even existed was Satan and his followers had created Eden, cast out, and that tree was put there as a place for them to live. Mm -hmm. You know, in God's perception, before before Satan and the angels rebelled, it was just good. And then they revealed evil. Does that make sense? They had to have some they had to have some place to put them that we could understand. Well, symbolically. What, what happens if we truly understand good and evil? That's a big question. <laughs> it is a big, big, big question because uh, good and evil are not opposites. It's not, here's good and here's evil, and they're opposite of one deal, another. Okay? I believe the term is a privation. What do you have to do to have rust? You have to have a combination of elements. Yeah. You have to have metal and you have to have oxygen to oxidize that, right? So rust only exists if there's metal that can oxidize. Does that make sense? Okay, so good and evil, good can exist totally on its own. Well, how do we know that? God is good. Evil is simply a, a diminishing of good. So when, when God says, you shall not shed innocent 
blood, that's good. If you do that, don't shed innocent blood. What's evil? If you do shed blood. Moving away from that. And then there are more, shall we say, steps to word a total evil. Little by little. Little by little, but you move away from it. And it can start, first of all, with the thought process, like, right? You shall not shed innocent blood. God did not accept my sacrifice. I'm mad. I'm, I'm angry with Abel because God did not accept my sacrifice. What am I going to do about it? If you act on that thought, you've created the evil. You, you, you start building it up. You're building up until you do act on it. Yeah. But wouldn't just the thought itself be an act of evil? Uh, no. <clears throat> and and I, I think I would, you know, where Jesus says, uh, if a man looks upon a woman to lust after, he's already committed adultery in his heart. Mm -hmm. But that is a step to word. Okay, so but but the person that's you know the guy that looks at a woman and says, man that's a good looking woman, but I'm married and I'm going the other way. Has he committed a sin? No, <clears throat> no. Now if he keeps going, <laughs> it'll lead him to sin. So the thought is not the sin; it's the action that's the sin. Right. It, it's when again. James. What does James say? Uh, when each person is tempted, when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. There's a lure and there's an enticement by the desire. But when desire, uh, then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. Okay? What happened? God told Cain, if you keep this up, sin is crouching at your door. And you've got to rule over it. Don't allow it to rule over you. What did he do? He just kept going until sin ruled over him. He killed his brother out of that anger. Does that make sense? If he had stopped there and said, you know, God, you are right. I'm going to go buy a sheep off of my brother and I'm going to come and sacrifice it to you. Please forgive me. No problem. Hypothetical question. Okay. Did, did, did God know what Adam and Eve's reaction was going to be to the tree when the serpent came out of them? Was it part of the plan? Or were they left to react on their own? Own free will. So God, God didn't know that was going to happen and take things in that direction. God knows everything. God knows it could happen. God knew every possibility. Just as in your life, God knows every possibility that you can take, knows all the probabilities that you would take, and knows what you probably will do, and may be surprised if you don't do it and actually do the right thing. So the, so the temptation... <laughs> that, that was the hypothetical there. So the temptation was set there. They fell into it, but that was always a possibility. They didn't have to. They could have said no. God said not so, to, not going to do it. So if they had not fallen into the temptation, everything would have been so different. Somebody else would have. Good point. Somebody else would have. Just like if Judas had not betrayed Jesus, somebody else would have. Did Judas receive pardon from God? Pardon? Yeah. No. Isn't suicide not pardonable? Well, it's not that. He didn't ask for forgiveness. And he's called the son of perdition. That's not a good thing. I wouldn't even deal with the suicide question there. He died not asking for forgiveness for his sin. And you can leave it at that. God will make the decisions on suicide. 
That's his department. That's not mine. That's God's department. Okay? Well, you did believe my theory of divine destiny. I've always believed that there's a divine destiny, that, that, that everything. How about to point? But the problem is, yeah, I understand what you're saying, but the problem is that makes God an author of evil. Did God make Judas do that? No. He did it by choice, didn't he? But th this is my question, okay? How, how, I mean, we, somebody had to betray Jesus for Jesus to be taken into Pontius Pilate. How was the choice made of who it was going to be? I mean, God knew that. that God always knew who it was going to okay, be. Okay, you have 12 apostles. God knew that any one of those 12 apostles could betray Jesus. He probably knew that the most likely character was Judas. And it wasn't that Judas wasn't warned. Didn't Jesus warn him? Yeah. 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 And he still did it. Because Jesus even warned the disciples when they were on the mount to stay awake and pray with him that his time had come. Yeah. So it was about, yeah, but in, in, in Gethsemane, uh, Judas wasn't there. Yeah. Remember, he, he had gone he to get in. But, but yeah, but it was choice. Again, it was his choice. And he was given many opportunities to go a different path. But somebody would have somewhere along the line. Was That's there a, anywhere in the Bible that a person was not given a choice? No. I don't think so. Even G listen, even Jesus was given a choice. Because yeah, he said, "Thy Father's will be done." That was his choice yeah. to do the Father's will, but he was given that choice. Now, yeah, Father, if there be any other way, let's take that way. But take that this is it. <laughs> While we're on the thought process, goes through my mind is, as a man thinketh, so is he. Mm -hmm. Is the sin, is the thought a sin or only the action? That tells me that the thought is the sin. Can be the sin. Mm -hmm. Without the action, the thought can be the sin without the action. Does that make sense? Hmm. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I, I, again, I think when Jesus was saying what he was saying about adultery and about murder, being angry, Okay, use anger. Okay, if, if a if a man is angry with his brother, uh, he's already committed murder in his heart. Right, that's what Jesus said. Right. But there are other scriptures, and Paul uses that and says, "Be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath." My perception, what I want, want it to be, is that thought is, this is what I want it to be, is that that thought is not the sin unless I dwell on that thought. If I dwell on that thought, I am maintaining the evil world within me. If I say, God struck Satan away from me, he's giving me a hard time today, get rid of, help me get rid of this thought. Before I sin. Before I sin. But if I dwell on it daily. Then it'll conceive and you will do. Eventually. The sin. And that's what, that's what I'm saying James is saying. Okay. The lust comes and when 
Let's read it again. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. That's so great. it's kind of conceived and then boom, you do it, and that's, that's sin. It's almost in the sense, you know, in, in uh, James or First Corinthians, Second Corinthians five twenty one, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Unless you understand sin in there, uh, in that one part to be a sin offering, it, you're going to accuse Jesus of having sin. And Jesus never sinned. And, and James sums yeah. sums it up for me. In those verses, that that's the perfect answer to my question that I hadn't read, yeah. and it didn't. Well, I, it didn't soak in. <laughs> yeah. So here, all humans, okay, but when we lust and we allow that to conceive, and then we sin, that creates the death. And right there, we're talking about spiritual death. We're no longer innocent, so to speak, we're separated from God. Okay? Now, I'm a lost sinner. Let's jump over here for a moment. Okay? See this up here? Infants? Notice this is kind of, it's kind of up here, but that's all humans. But when you have infants and you have the incapacitated You probably all know of children. We had a niece that, she's six months old no, when she, she was, got the shot. Or, she was three months old. Three months old, had a reaction to the whooping cough. She never, though she grew up physically, she was never able to communicate or anything. She lived to be 20, Eight. 28 years old. She could never have sinned. No. Okay. People who, if an infant dies, Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. You can go ahead and look at it, because I don't think I had that down right here. It's going to be later coming up. But, but I want before we close today, I want you to understand that. Uh, that in our world there are people who are innocent and there are people who are sinners. Two categories according to the Bible. There's no kind of in between. Well, Matthew 18, 3. And said, Truly I say unto you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Turn and become like children. Okay. And there are other passages in the Old Testament that talks about, uh, I think it's in the book of Jonah, about those who, they don't even know their right hand from their left hand. How could they know the difference between right and wrong? Uh, so, Jesus said, uh, don't prevent the little children from coming to me because that's what the kingdom of heaven's made up of. They're innocent. So if, if they die, they're going to go... You're not going to see it there. So can I ask you the paradise in the Indian realm. Can I ask you a question? Then? Yes, go ahead. So, children go to heaven, okay? So, paradise. Paradise. Yeah, paradise. They were saying that. So, when talking about the blood over the thing, the Egyptians back in the old days, so every one of them children went to the earth. They were gone in. You talking about in Egypt? The yeah, Passover? Egypt, yeah, the Passover when they all. All the kids, passed, all the kids passed away. The first, oh, the firstborn. Yeah, yeah. All of them who were in that category. Yeah, God's not going to send them. Now, if the firstborn was fifty years old and was persecuting the Jews. 
or the Hebrews, yeah, he might. <laughs> but if you're talking about a baby, then we would say no, yeah. Yeah, without sin. And, and the same thing, you know, when the children of Israel go into Canaan, they're told to kill all of them. Well, well, no, but the children also, and people say, how could they, you know, they're killing the children. But, and I know it sounds terrible, please understand me, if you're looking at it in this sense, those children are going to be saved for, safe for eternity. But there was a judgment against the idolaters. And remember, that time period was just a few hundred years after the flood. Look on the time chart there. They weren't far past the flood. Abraham probably sat on Noah's knee when he was a baby. Didn't take him long to turn back to evil, did it? Fred, there's one thing I don't understand. When somebody passes away, they always say they're going to heaven. But actually, they're not. They're going to paradise. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Huh? <laughs> I, I'm laughing, real. but... Look, the AD and realm has got two parts. Yeah. yeah. And we're, we're, we will address that when we get to it, but yeah, the Hadean realm, that's that's over here. Yeah, hey, right now we're talking about earth life. What's going, I just wanted to hit this so that there's no misunderstanding because of that false doctrine that we're born sinners, okay? Psalm 51, David, it, it, and especially in King James, uh, I was born in sin and in iniquity. My mother brought me forth or whatever. Still not saying anything about David. It's talking about being born into a sinful world and whatever. Don't, don't twist the scriptures with one little piece. Okay? We can talk about that later if you want to. But here's where we got to today. Okay? Here's the world as God created it, all the human beings there, and here's how we get to be lost. So the world, we're either innocent or we're sinners. Okay. Next week we'll start here with what do I need to do if I'm a lost sinner to be saved and the consequences of not doing that. Okay? Very good. All right. Amen. Thank you for your time and attention.